Okay, well, it seems like a good time to start. We're live. Welcome, everyone. This is a conversation about building food security around the world and food partnerships for food security around the world. Uh, my name is Stephen Melnick. It's my honor and pleasure to be invited to speak and moderate this important conversation. Earlier, uh, we heard United Nations Secretary General speak with Harris, and he discussed very important elements of the reality we all live in. But these are very difficult times, and certainly COVID causing new issues in food supply. And, you know, as we all know, difficult times create amazing and new opportunities. So hopefully we'll touch upon many related topics. There's a lot to discuss. I have a panel of esteemed uh, individuals, and I think a good way to start is for all of us to introduce ourselves first. So since I started, um, my name is, uh, as I said, Steve Melnick. I'm based in New York City. I'm a founder of political and business diplomacy.org. We help Countries, governments bring technology, industries, um, agriculture, sustainable agriculture into the countries, help develop them and help negotiate treaties and cooperation agreements and bring countries into the world so the world is aware and uh, I serve as ambassador um, in that regard. And um, on the nonprofit end, uh, I'm involved in a few nonprofits around the world where we bring humanitarian aid to many parts in places that need help. Uh, I'm based, as I said, in New York City. I'm a tenure professor in the largest business school in the US and um, best-selling author and so on and so forth. But I think what's more important is for you to hear uh, from our panel members. So let's start. And maybe, Adrita, maybe we could start with you uh, and you could introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you, Stephen. My name is Adrita Nori and I'm based in London. Um, I'm the founder of a company called Inside Capital. My prior experience last seven years has been working with early stage and growth stage companies um, and also working with family offices and investors to invest in the startup um, ecosystem. Uh, currently, we built a new model, which is a profit share model to invest into growth stage companies, which provides non-dilutive capital to companies. And then in terms of investors, it provides liquidity for the investors Sectors we invest in is future of living, future of consumption, and future of communication. Uh, yeah, and uh, we are probably about eight months down the road of this new fund. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Mark? Um, thanks, Stephen. Um, Mark Collingsworth. I'm the chief executive of the Nutrition Society, um, again, based in, uh, in London, in England. Um, it's a body for um, for scientists and academics and policymakers for nutrition. Uh, although based in England, um, we've landed up with uh, 2,800 members now in 85 countries around the world. So we have very much a, a, a global reach. Um, I'm the only person who is not a nutritionist or a scientist or an academic. So I'm an ex-military man who's now running an organization that he knows very little about the topic of. So um, my interest is strategy and leadership um, uh, and, and taking this body to be this broker in the world that brings together and, and uh, scientists, academics, uh, with, through conferences, through publishing the science, um, and really that kind of soft power-ish piece of, of collaboration and building networks um, to sustain nutrition across the world. Very good. Thank you very much, Mark. Konstantin, please. Uh, thanks, Stephen. Hello, my name is Konstantin Marakhov. Uh, I'm originally from Ukraine, but now I'm based for quite a long time in Switzerland. Uh, my background is actually economics and finance, but uh, now for more than three years, I run a startup company, which is focusing on uh, <clears throat> consumer products based on cannabis. And... Um, we're, we're quite successful here. We're one of the leading companies in Europe. And uh, this is what I do. Beautiful. Wonderful. Thank you. Stepan? So good morning from uh, Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm actually based in uh, Washington, D.C. area, but I am the CEO for the International Water Security Foundation, as well as I'm a director for Space Tech. Um, the last two years I've been in the United States. Prior to that, I was spent uh, three years as an advisor to the president of Kyrgyzstan on foreign direct investment. 
my background is economic development and emerging markets. And uh, I served also as a COO for Orbital Technologies. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And Luigi, please. Hello, everyone. My name is Luigi Cavallito. I'm originally from Italy, but I live in Beirut. And uh, I'm the chief operating officer of Seats and Chips. Uh, Seats and Chips is an organization that started in Milan after the Expo of 2015 uh, that was focused uh, on food innovation. Uh, and we took this kind of uh, heritage uh, and uh, tried to work uh, with people, even like Constantin that participated, uh, uh, to understand uh, how some words that are not really connected to the others uh, can work together for uh, developing a better future. And food is something that most of the time is related to nature and agriculture and not to technology. So when we started Seats and Chips, uh, Five years ago, there was not so many companies around the world uh, that thought that technology was the main component uh, of the future of food. Right now, it's something that uh, it's uh, most well known and also for the success uh, of the stories like uh, Beyond Meat uh, or Impossible Burgers uh, or something that is very popular in uh, the kind of uh, perspective of the people. But when you go to food system, uh, it's very difficult to understand where to start and where to finish. So Sits and Chips aim uh, to bring together at the table people from um, different walks of, walk of life, uh, such as uh, CEOs, uh, presidents, uh, startuppers, and even teenagers, uh, because you never know where uh, this innovation can start. Okay, Luigi, that was a broad introduction. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate it. So maybe with this kind of setup that Luigi did uh, about industry already and what's happening, uh, at the end of the day, when we talk about food security, you know, we cannot ignore the biggest topic, which is world hunger, right? And of course, there's a lot of discussion about it all over the world for a long time. And it seems to me one of the biggest misconceptions um, in this type of conversation is the thought, the assumption that there's just simply not enough food already to feed people, right? And I think any expert who is really involved in this field will agree with me that that's just simply not the case. There are different issues, bigger issues, related issues, tangent issues that need to be addressed. And maybe we could have a conversation on that. And maybe I'll go in the same order. So, uh, Adrita, what are your thoughts on this? Is hunger, world hunger, really about lack of food or is it something else? It's lack of process and system, uh, in my uh, humble opinion, uh, Stephen. So I grew up in Bangladesh and, you know, it's one of, I'm not sure how many of you know, it's one of the most populous country in the world. Um, and then the hunger is a, is, is a big issue. But when I look at the actual system, it's a problem with the system of channels and how things are distributed and access to knowledge, access to education. Um, and exactly to your point that it's not really about whether we don't have enough facility and opportunities to produce. And the other thing is also perhaps to um, do with the trade where there's no free trade. So there's like a lot of, uh, you know, th there's a lot of production that the government usually, at least in Asia, um, uh, as far as my knowledge is concerned, that the government will have enough produ production and then they will do certain deals with the farmers of how they will, and they would have a lot of supply. So there's no shortage of supply, but then sometimes they wouldn't actually go and then distribute that properly. And then hence that creates that mismatch. And in terms of just, um, because I don't want to take too much time to get into details, but um, it's, it's a problem definitely which can be solved partly using technology just because of, of what, what we look at and how technology can solve part of the problem. Um, well, so thank you. So since we talk about technology and certainly, you know, many, many industries these days get completely transformed due yeah. to technology, right? Yes. Uh, Luigi, you touched upon this a little bit earlier. So going back to the topic of technology, what do you see the major contribution and maybe some specifics uh, that you could share with us how technology actually addresses this very issue? Uh, so thanks for the question. Uh, and uh, when you think about the herd, sometimes uh, you have a, a misperception of where to look. So one of the most disruptive industry in agriculture is actually the space industry. Because uh, when you talk about precision agriculture, uh, it's all based on drones, satellites, uh, and how you merge uh, all these big data that you can uh, put together. And so it's really like a challenging right now to figure out uh, what are the technologies that are applied uh, 
to something that uh, we uh, give it for granted for centuries. So agriculture never changed and the food production for several centuries because we didn't have the technology to look at it uh, on a different way. And right now there is, uh, I agree totally, like uh, with what Adrita says, it's a problem of design. So we designed the system that is based on the knowledge that we had before. And more or less we designed it uh, hundreds of years ago and we little, but really little updated it uh, with the industrial revolution because we applied industrial revolution on urban environments, not food environments. So right now it's like that we have uh, an hardware that is uh, updated, but the software is not. So the knowledge about it, uh, it's not uh, focusing on the right problem. So right now we need more people uh, interested uh, on connected dots uh, on things uh, that we are not uh, believing are related to food. So for example, uh, like how we challenge the locust crisis. At a certain point when there was COVID, uh, African part of Asia was literally destroyed by a herd of locusts just jumping around from a crop to another. And this thing, it was out of the radar because no one had a solution. You have literally millions of insects that are destroying agriculture, but then the countries are closed because there is COVID. So it's a matter of design of a multilateral kind of solution where it's not only technology, I totally agree, and the Humans are probably the best technologies uh, that uh, exist uh, still uh, on uh, this universe, uh, as far as we know, because we don't know a lot about the universe. Uh, and um, I heard someone talking about saying, if we spend all uh, the money that we are now investing on uh, artificial intelligence, on uh, human intelligence and emotional intelligence in order to like work together and fix the problems that we have created, maybe we have more uh, like technological solutions that are driven to action. Very good, very good, very interesting. Thank you. Very, very good perspective. And please remember, if anybody wants to add on, let me know uh, in your comments. But uh, building on this, and certainly technology takes us in many different directions, right, to make things more efficient, more effective, but also kind of creates new approaches and kind of -of out-of-the-box solutions. So one of the hot topics these days is kind of developing meatless food sources, right? And um, this is certainly where, you know, major organizations and governments are focusing in a very, very serious way. Uh, I certainly see it in, you know, all over the place. And the question becomes, is this a solution? I know, uh, Stepan, uh, me and you corresponded um, and communicated a bit on this topic. I know you had some thoughts on it. Uh, may I ask you to comment on this in terms of developing these types of solutions? Well, I think that in relation to meatless food and uh i know i think luigi you mentioned about uh impossible foods and beyond food um or beyond meat um it i think there's a cultural aspect for this as well because in countries like the united states in europe you will have success um i spent uh as i said three years in kyrgyzstan but i've spent about 10 years in central asia where it'll it's very difficult um to get the perception of uh, vegetarianism or getting away from uh, meat as part of the diet. So I think that that's gonna be a a challenge. Now, it will pick up in places like Asia, you're seeing a lot more openness to it um, with like chains like Burger King that have implemented uh, the Impossible Burgers there throughout their chains in asia um there is an opportunity but uh you know again moving i guess looking at you know how do we go towards more of a meatless uh society where the the cost to implement uh or produce meat products is you know thousands of times what it takes like uh, I know we were talking about it with uh, this morning on the water security uh, panel that it takes 150 cups of water to make one cup of coffee or in California it takes 2,000 liters of water to make a kilogram of avocados there are challenges Um, one of the opportunities I think that will be is that we've got to look at there's 20,000 plants that are edible, but 
is human beings were only utilizing a small fraction of those. Um, and then again, some of the fract the you know some of these plants that we utilize, we're utilizing them to produce meat um, in a non-productive way. Um, but I think there's going to be a cultural education aspect of getting people to look at going to a meatless society or going, you know, minimizing their meat consumption. Very, very, very important point. Yes, Adrida, you want to add something? Uh, one uh, small point, just to see this point, that I think, A, it's, um, there are so much, uh, again, going back to production, and one example could be actually something like jackfruit, which is an alternative to meat. It's more about mm -hmm. different governments and culture experimenting and spending more money and time on research and really coming up with, like, different food tasting menu and then kind of going into more research of, like, it's, it's the cultural perception that, you know, you're, we're so used to eating meat that we almost don't want to um, initially just disregard that, you know, anything vegan is not tasty, but actually it's quite the opposite right now. And the reason we were actually last year, we did spend some time in Thailand. And I come from, as I said, Bangladesh, like jackfruit is our national fruit. And we actually saw this so much waste because they don't actually know after exporting like the regional level local level people just use it as fruit and that's that but now for example the us and europe they're doing a lot of research on all those kind of different fruits and plants and then th that can be used as an alternative and can be very very tasty it's really about adding innovation and technology and then using those ingredients but, yeah. Certainly makes sense and rita uh but with this big wave of kind of going meatless right, uh, which is a new big hot topic, again, for many, many good reasons. You know, there is a question, uh, is this really kind of a long-term healthy solution? And um, yeah, and there are some experts that kind of questioning this, and, and specifically the longevity of the plant-based diet, although humanity may not have a choice at some point, maybe. But Konstantin, if I may ask your opinion on this, um, I know we had a discussion before, and um, you know, interestingly enough, while you are, you know, involved in kind of plant-based business, but at the same time, you know, you, you're being kind of very fair and partial in your thoughts in terms of, you know, will, will this hold back to plants or new road to plant-based diet? Will it really backfire in terms of health? Uh, can you share your thoughts on this? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you. Actually, uh, I will be probably a little bit uh, going against mainstream here because uh, now the mainstream, hey, let's all go vegan, you know, let's let's not kill animals and do things. And actually, for me, if you look at uh, meatless diet or pro protein-based diet, there are two issues. One issue for me, like, you know, if you look over, overall at uh, vegan lifestyle, let's say it could be like, let's say, spiritual or ethical choice of somebody. Yeah. Somebody say, hey, I'd like to go vegan just because I don't like cruelty in animals. In this case, for me, there is like a very like obvious question. So why do we need to imitate meat? Yeah, first hand. If somebody say, hey, I would like to go vegan, you know, we continue to eat, you know, like vegetable and fruits. You don't need to imitate animals, you know, because it's a little bit counterproductive. Uh, second aspect, of course, you know, when we speak of switching people who have been used to a meat diet, and suddenly, because of the fashion, because of the hype, you know, people will be switching to a uh, meatless diet. We don't know really health implications. Of course, you know, we can say, hey, like it's good, you know, being without meat is excellent. We have like uh, nations and regions where people don't eat so much meat, you know, and also like in some religions, but probably it doesn't work for everybody. So we still have so many unanswered issues. And of course, um, you know, like then uh, when we look at the, um, let's say, Beyond Burger or Beyond Meat, you know, sorry, Incredible Burger, it's still very processed food. While the movement, you know, like overall is, hey, guys, let's go to the whole food. So this is a good question. So for me, it's more questions than answers. And it's more based on the hype uh, and less on real scientific or economic data. Yeah, I love this um, kind of out of the box uh, against the grain perspective. Uh, you know, the, the, you know, people get excited a lot <laughs> uh, and, uh, and it's interesting. I mean, I see, again, all over the, with these conversations, you know, what, what is really going to be long-term effect? This is important, you know, because at the end of the day, you know, of course people have to eat. And if there is no food, something has to be done, right? And something 
arguably is better than nothing, but at the end of the day, it does come back to nutrition, right? So, um, you know, it's not simply by being fed, but about health, being healthy ultimately on a long-term basis and about getting everything that you need. And this is something, Mark, if you don't mind, uh, I'd like to ask your opinion on um, as a former military uh, individual, you know, you're very much into strategy, but I know you're looking at the substance and all these conversations about feeding people, uh, you know, quite often the, the, the nutrient element kind of gets lost. Uh, could you share some of your perspectives on this? Uh, yes, there's quite a few uh, very quick points, if I could make, which I hopefully will all tie up. The first one, going right back to your first point about hunger, um, it, to me, it's um, it's more complicated than just having an empty belly. It's um, it's about uh, poverty. It's about economic inequality. It's about gender discrimination. Uh, it's weak health systems. So it's much more than just um, just food. But on the on the nutrient um, uh, issue. That is really interesting. Um, now I'm just referring to my notes because I don't want to get the numbers wrong. Uh, so please bear with me. But two million people now have sufficient calories but insufficient nutrients. Uh, One billion people have got insufficient calories and insufficient nutrients. And two and a half billion people consume too many calories but still don't get enough nutrients. There's only three billion people in the world who've actually got it right. Um, so there is a there is a massive disconnect. Uh, uh, across the world with this Um, and if you look at the the meat or the meatless issue um, that just adds to the complexity and then brings in the environment because uh, to get all the appropriate calcium and the protein that you need in a sustainable diet if you give up meat Mm -hmm. most of the products you need to eat if you are in England, in the United Kingdom, you can't get those in England. They've got to be transported and shipped from other parts of the world to England. So that is actually damaging the environmental uh, uh, footprint and, and issue. So uh, as Constantine said, that's that's a disconnect that uh, nobody seems to be able to, uh, to talk about. And the last one, I spent quite a bit of time last year in Africa. I was in Rwanda, uh, Ethiopia, and Kenya, and I met quite a few small farms where they have one or two cows. And if you talk to them about giving up their prized possession, which produces the meat, uh, produces the milk, um, it it grazes, uh, their whole small holding, their whole life exists around a number of small, very meat-based animals. So going meatless is not a global issue because certainly in those parts of Africa I visited last year, um, it is it is what's keeping them alive. Um, again, a, a, a disconnect. So the disconnect is perhaps the point I, I, I'd like to finish on because I think that's probably worthy of a bit more. Yeah, I think I think disconnect is actually a very, very good point on many levels. I mean, from the points you mentioned is one thing, but, um, you know, a lot of these discussions quite often kind of become a little bit too esoteric and too academic, so to speak, and, you know, being an academic, I'll admit it. And sometimes we forget, you know, I am um, a partner in global gaming lottery conglomerate. We operate in about 40 countries. And we, when we engage in a country, especially poor countries, you know, all these conversations that we have in, in all these uh, uh, panels. And But when you hit the reality and you see how people actually live and operate, and the, even if the food is there, let me see if I could quickly um, share the screen just kind of, to address the disconnect comment because it's really hit me uh, very hard. Um, You know, even when you deliver food, right, Uh, and you could see uh, Liberal Aid Foundation, by the way, um, is one of the nonprofits I'm involved in um, as an honorary uh, advisory board member. And uh, if you look, once even if when food is delivered, like logistics we talked about before, let me just quickly show, find a picture, uh, where people had to carry these, like, there is no way for many even to take it home because local infrastructure, and we ended up even partnering with the local Red Cross to get the food out. People cannot, um, let me see, so, so I don't mess this up, but people cannot basically even take the food, bring it to home. Uh, you know, some people get robbed on the way. So 
you know, when we talk about all these things, you know, speaking of disconnect, this is, there are so many elements that have to be kept in mind um, that, and that actually need to be addressed. But Constantine, I, I know you wanted to add to this. Yeah, I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on Mark's statement about, you know, disruption of, uh, you know, our desires and, uh, you know, our, let's say, intentions and reality. Uh, the problem for me, it's, and it's a big problem that classical uh, economics, you know, like, uh, doesn't work. There is a huge disruption between food production on a local level. We really would like to localize a lot of things and uh, domination of the market by big corporations where they actually don't give any chance for smaller companies to produce and grow and supply locally. So actually corporate greed and corporate um, hunting for profit doesn't correspond to current reality where we need to address, you know, like a lot of food issues also connected with innovation. And before, and, and unless this will continue, you know, we'll never have solutions, you know. Yeah. Corporations are not able to resolve the, a lot of existing issues, in my opinion. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, corporations, because of corporate greed, um, and there is the, that view cannot resolve these issues. In the same time, there is another view that government cannot resolve these issues. Government is a corporation. <laughs> 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 so then what is the what is so the government cannot address it private sector cannot address it are, are we waiting for aliens to come and save us because what are the other options uh, who wants to comment mark please i'll quickly comment I, one of the opening sessions this morning was a a, a discussion around leadership and it was uh rania al mashad from uh, from egypt and she spoke about the challenges of um of, of being a woman and trying and as a government minister uh, making progress in a male dominated environment but she spoke about the four C's um, of good leadership um, that everybody should have but if women have them it really does uh, uh, bring them on but uh, if you forget the gender bit for a moment and two of those two of those C's one was connections and the other was charm and she meant by charm kind of emotional intelligence but that ability to get on with people that you've connected with um, and going back to my early comment about soft power, um, it, to me, that is what is where the solution sits. It's building those relationships. It doesn't perhaps have to be led by government or led by a corporation. It is down to the likes of the six of us and others who collaborate, who get together, uh, who come up with innovative solutions and have a desire to make the change and have the charm to uh, 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 to force it through. So uh, you could almost say it's got to come back down to grassroots level, a lot of these issues. Um, learn what's going on at the grassroots and then build it up, perhaps bringing in support the higher up you. It certainly sounds like that, and I see more and more people are joining uh, this session as uh, observers. I'd like to encourage, to the extent people have questions, uh, please either type them or there's a way to um, take a mic and, and speak. We'll figure out how to accommodate it, but don't be shy uh, because we purposely planned this discussion, so we'll leave uh, some time at the end for questions. Uh, with that said, not seeing questions so far, I'd like to go back and kind of uh, address this, um, not specifically corporate greed, but some of the issues that come out from kind of corporate engagement and matters. And one of it is, um, you know, the balancing between output and the environment, right? Which is another big, big, big matter. Because um, it's simply, it's not simply, you know, about getting the result, getting enough production, but and having enough food, but having a decent place to live in this wonderful planet Earth, right? So anybody would like to comment on this? And how do we keep this balance, Luigi? Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, we know that uh, as uh, everyone say in this panel, uh, we need to think about an holistic approach of the problem. And I totally agree when Mark says it's not uh, only about nutrients and calories, it's about uh, gender equality and everything. And I really believe that uh, right now we have an agenda for development that is the one proposed by the United Nations and yes, the Sustainable Development Goals Agenda and the Agenda 2030 that is setting the bar high for everyone in the world. And due to the concern, uh, I totally agree, even uh, with uh, Constantine that says uh, there is a mismatching between reality and expectation. Uh, I think not only in the food system, but in the system in general. Uh, and this is the main problem. Uh, but uh, 
we have not developed uh, in these years uh, something called patience. So we expect that everything uh, is going to happen in our lifetime. While in the history of humanity, it took a long time to make a difference. So right now we want that uh, meatless is something that is going to happen uh, tomorrow, a meatless society, that uh, we are the best one on uh, uh, saving biodiversity. While uh, it's not aligned, the leadership of countries, uh, the leadership of uh, companies, uh, and uh, even inside our own uh, kind of uh, circles of people, uh, just to not go to talk uh, all the time about uh, the corporate leaders and the governmental leaders or ministers, uh, we all know, because we are part of the Oasis Vision community, ministers, prime ministers, uh, CEOs of companies, uh, executives and everything. And um, we make the difference, uh, but we still don't have all the answers. So raising questions, uh, it's something that it's like uh, we enhance the dialogue. Uh, and uh, for example, during COVID, I start gardening because I was at home all the time. Uh, and I say, okay, maybe it's the good time to start to understand really what is to grow a plant. That is something that I talk about in all the conference, but I never experienced that. I never mm -hmm. like made a tomato in my like garden. And this is stupid maybe, but it's really like that uh, our disconnection is based because uh, we have based our society on uh, looking at solutions without asking what is the real problem. So right now it's like the problem is bigger than us, so no one of us is going to find out a solution. Only yeah. the collaboration and the different perspective put on a different kind of, not even paper, but platform. Because for COVID, what was effective, it wasn't like someone releasing papers. We have a, one different paper every day from one different source. It was about, guys, we need all the brains of the world, all the resources available to tackle the problem. So Thank when you. they... Thank you. I they, they, everybody they, will get a chance to to share their thoughts too before we run out of time. But this was very good perspective. When you say, you know, we forget that certain things take a lifetime to accomplish, and this is certainly very true and beyond lifetime. And building on what Mark said before, that at the end of the day, it's going to come down to individual leadership. Uh, I just want to share with you, yesterday, uh, I, uh, one of the gentlemen who's participating in one of the other panels reached out to me and he said, you know, what we will be talking about sounds very interesting. What he did, and this is just right on the point of, of everything we talk about. During the COVID time, difficult time, right, as UN Secretary General mentioned today, uh, creates an opportunity for many people to make a difference, for leaders. So what this gentleman did, he took shipping containers. He figured out a way through the solar, solar panel how to put in refrigeration because what he figured out is that one of the biggest issues in food distribution is lack of proper refrigeration, and a lot of it goes to waste. So he reached out during the virus time, I mean, I find it mind-blowing, to major food producers who basically, he's basically now diverting food from landfills, from garbage, into shelters, distribution all over California, New York. He fed hundreds of thousands of people. This is the story of one person COVID situation, this lifetime, in fact, within a few months, and just making a difference. So I think it's, so it, to me, and we had a conversation because I was blown away from it. I said, can you replicate this model globally? Because, you know, I'll take you to every government. You know, you, you're going to be big as a hero there. You know, I think this one, one action speaks louder than a thousand words, right? So I think at the end of the day, it seems to me it has to be a combination, right? You know, it's always, you know, the change is made by individuals, right? And they trigger, you know, all the other effects and so on and so forth and organizations and governments. And at the end of the day, I think everyone has to do what can be done to work together. And speaking of work together, working together, one question then becomes, you know, especially since we live in such integrated world these days, regardless of formality of integration, right? So is there a way for governments to cooperate in this? As global leaders, you know, and last year, I think most of you attended the Global Leaders Summit. And, you know, we're always trying to figure out how can we make things work globally? And you cannot make it work globally by saying, seems to me that, you know, it just doesn't work or government cannot do it. Something has to be done, right? So how can we get governments to cooperate? Because I think from that level, a lot of things could trickle down potentially. Any thoughts, anybody? 
um, Stephen, I think government can also enable smaller, more innovative companies to come up with certain solutions and have some incentives for them to go and then implement something. Because whenever we're looking at government taking a step, the hierarchy and the whole red tape is so strong, it takes a lot longer. Whereas sometimes in an earlier stage company, so we were looking at company in Indonesia where they used blockchain to do two things. One was traceability of food, where it goes from how the information is processed from the farmers to the end users. And then they try to do the same process for fishermen, for example, where that would cut the middle people. But then that on its own is very challenging. Some parts of the world it's easier uh, you know, to do, but then other parts of the world where they don't have access to technology, access to devices, understanding the access to credit facility, and then creating all that stuff. So I think the government's role doesn't need, have to be that the government will have to come up with the tech-enabled solutions, but then providing or having enough uh, resources and you know, um, help for the up-and-coming leaders and companies to kind of help them enable, like, um, go and solve that because I think there are enough, at least in the startup and growth state states, we see that enough entrepreneurs, enough companies are coming up with very, very innovative ideas. But then sometimes they're just quite stuck, A, sometimes because they don't have enough funding to go and make those big steps and make, make those big changes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Stepan, I wanted to ask you a question. Uh, okay. So I wanted to add on to before you ask the question. Um, in Kyrgyzstan, we have the challenge, of course, because Kyrgyzstan has limited resources. Um, and together with UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization and World Bank, we set up uh, PPPs, uh, public-private uh, partnerships, which drove a lot of the development. And one of our key sectors was agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we found that the private sector was able to find a lot of the solutions that the government could not implement themselves, but they would, the government would almost act as a guarantor for that. Right. So now exactly. I'll let you go ahead and ask your question, sorry. Yeah, my question was, you know, since we talk about, you know, global approach to things, right? Uh, you know, people like you go beyond global and go into state, right, with your interests. Um, any, any progress on that end? Can space save us at some point? There, I mean, one of the things that we're doing in space is, I mean, say with like COVID-19, we do microgravity research, which uh, presents opportunities. There's also up on the ISS, there's uh, actually some agricultural projects to see what type of seeds will grow in space and what the impact of microgravity uh, atmosphere has on that. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I've been involved in the space industry for a few years, but I also believe there's a lot of money that we put into space. And I know my, my colleagues in the space industry will not like me saying this. We have, you know, we have to find solutions on Earth. Why do we want to go and do something in space necessarily before we find the solutions here? Makes perfect sense. And speaking of solutions and development of new solutions and new Food products. Certainly, if you look at around the world, the, the hot topic, if we were to zoom in on one particular element of it, is hemp, right? This is kind of a new green revolution uh, with a lot of very, very promising solutions for humanity. Uh, Constantine, I know you're in this space and uh, you're doing quite well in that space in a very particular niche. Do you think um, some of the issues that we touched upon, not simply with food, uh, you know, obtaining plant-based protein and so on and so forth, but also nutrition. I know there's still a lot of research being done in this area. You, as an expert in this field, uh, you think there's a hope that we could get some help uh, in terms of solving this issue through the hemp-related industry? Uh, you actually touched a very hot uh, point because, you know, uh, I, I can speak I, I can speak about hemp for hours, yeah, like, but uh, I will try to be short. Uh, when we speak about hemp, hemp is a very good um, uh, species for agriculture because uh, of certain reasons. First, uh, it has amazing yield for the farmer. It, it's not uh, sensitive to a lot of climate um, you know, environment. It could grow in different climate uh, uh, conditions. And uh, third, it doesn't exo exhaust the land. Plus, of course, you know, it has a lot of usage uh, in both light industry, heavy industry, and nutrition. 
and it's very it's a definitely very interesting topic to discuss but actually you know i i said i would like to add something we had a very nice discussion but we never touch the point of food safety per se because we're saying hey guys there is so much innovation let's move product from here to there let's fi fight food waste with redist uh, redistributing this waste but what about safety you know how people will not be poisoned how can you control the quality of the food this is the biggest issue and who should control government or private bodies and uh, i would like just to go back to this topic a little bit well this is a good topic to touch upon absolutely i mean uh, I think the doctors have their uh, oath, you know, do no harm, right, while trying to cure. This is certainly very applicable in this case, you know, while trying to find a way to feed people, we certainly don't want to hurt them. We address this indirectly through nutrition, right, before, but uh, certainly explicit standards. So would anybody like to add to this particular point or make a comment? I just want to say, um, you know, on this topic and related topic, when we talk about uh, food security and you kind know, of global perspective, part of the issue that was always fueling this type of conversation is uh, population growth, right? So this is like a perfect storm, right? Not enough food or as we discussed, kind of enough food, but there is no way to get it in the way, proper way and for all the reasons. But then the population is exploding. Well, I don't know if you've seen the latest studies, but something interesting is happening. You know, UN came out with the studies showing and, and private think tanks came out with studies showing that actually we are about to come close to a point, pivot point, where the population is going to start going down, actually. Okay. And they disagree on exact time. But that is, in my mind, this is directly connected to this conversation about global food security, right? Because one way to address food shortage is certainly if, you know, and there's a lot of conversation about it, but if there's this natural decrease in global population, why is it natural? Precisely because of some of the issues we, again, indirectly touched upon. First and foremost is education for women, right? As women become more educated, studies show over and over again, the more educated the woman is, the less children she's going to have, you know, access to contraceptives, yeah. you know, it's another element that, that kind of changes this whole dynamic. So it seems like there is another, you know, storm coming up. But in, in this particular time, uh, in this particular case, it may be actually help, helping uh, our topic, which is the food shortages. Any comments, anybody on this? Please, Mark. Yeah, I, going back to that food security. Yeah, well. the, the one thing we haven't, uh, we haven't touched on in food security is education. We have a good education system is the foundation to solve most of the world's problems, not just not just food and you know, bringing on uh, better opportunities uh, for people. So an education system builds human capacity, human potential, um, which brings us better researchers and scientists and leaders. Um, so the people piece uh, is very important. Um, one quick statistic, which is terrifying, uh, not wishing to end on a, on a down note, but WHO revealed the other day that one million people have now died of COVID. Um, the world has come to a halt, economic disasters all around us, millions of people losing their jobs. Nine million people died last year of starvation and malnutrition. And we're not putting an ounce of the resources we're putting into COVID into solving that. So part of the depopulation, if I could call it that, is also just people not surviving their full length of life, which is tragic. Yes. Well, we have one minute left. <clears throat> uh, any 10 second comment from anyone? Anybody who feels there's some important element? I mean, we have very, very limited time today. I don't see questions from the audience and the audience continues to grow, which is very nice. OK, well, in, in that case, you know, at the end of the day, uh, while discussion doesn't change things. Right. But I think it's important to have these types of conversations. And what I always love about, uh, and especially, frankly speaking, Carassa's gathering, is that at each panel, you know, we, we always end up with, with people who are leading the conversation and not just conversation, but in substance, the actions in particular industries from different fields. And we've heard from each one of you different perspectives that at the end of the day, to make things work, I think we got to once again put different thoughts, approaches, 
experiences um, together in order to get something working. And this is something that always excited me. And I wanted to thank you very much for participation. Again, it's been an honor and pleasure to lead this discussion. And I'm very much looking forward to many more. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think we should take a uh, group selfie, I suggest. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can figure out how to do that. Okay, so I got an option, but okay, start. Okay, so everybody's ready? Let's see. Let's see if we could do this. Um, well, how do we do groupie? One second. I, I, do you guys have an option? I think everybody does his own and then it combines them. Oh, that's it. I, I don't want to see my own. I want to see everybody. And it combines from. Okay. Well, yeah, I just uh, well, thinking it was the group, but it's just me. One yeah. minute. If, if you can get it back to the where we're in the full screen, I can do something and uh, email it to all of you. Yeah, let's let's see. I've got a message now saying waiting for all the attendees to take. Yeah, selfies. probably it will generate something funny. Oh, maybe they're just taking selfie, selfie. Yeah, but <clears throat> one more to go. Well, so how do I, how do I get out from this now? One second. Um. Okay, I don't know how to get out from here. It's still, my, mine's still saying one person still hasn't done it. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, some, Hello? Someone, yes, Andrea. Okay, I don't know. Um, Stepan, Stepan, you said you could take a picture of all of us? Is that what you said? Yes. So why don't you do that, please? You, you, okay. I, I forgot, you're the, the technologically developed person here. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not actually not a technology person, but no. Okay, one minute. Okay, I've got something, so I will send to you guys. Lovely. Well, thank you again, everybody. Uh, mm -hmm. maybe we'll, uh, from what I understand, I think this was being recorded by the platform or something along these lines. So maybe there's going to be a posting of this video and we could... Um, Maybe at some point enjoy rewatching it and replaying it. But it was a real pleasure, and I think it worked out quite nicely. What do you think? Yeah, I, I thought we covered all the key points. So it'd be interesting to see a, a kind of transcript of that discussion. I think that would be interesting. I don't know if that's possible, whether they're recording these. I guess they are. Well, there should be a video on this. Hmm. Okay, well... I think we could now enjoy. We, by the way, did you see? We had uh, more people than we expected. Yeah. yeah. So, which which is very good. Makes me very happy. So maybe we could now visit individually some other sessions. But meanwhile, wanted to wish everybody well, and it was a real pleasure again meeting everybody. And hopefully, maybe soon we'll meet in person, right? And yeah. uh, harass us with that, which will be much nicer. Yeah, I've already booked my hotel room. So. Good. <laughs> Guys, next year. Very good. Thank you again, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, and let's keep in touch. Ciao. Ciao. Ciao.